Um, there are many different aspects that are affecting the, I'd say, the financial ecosystem, and many of the paradigms we all grew up with are changing, including who gives banking services and how it's done. But I think that one of the interesting paradigms that are being changed right now is money itself. And the changes that are happening because of the technology that is available, which we're talking about blockchain technology, and the invention of Bitcoin and other digital currencies. We're going to be looking at both of these aspects separately and then combining them together. Now when I'm talking about these changes, they're based on the computational power that we all hold in our hands without even noticing. Do you know that the phone that you're holding in your hand is stronger than the first IBM that sent a spaceship? Okay? That's the amount of computational power that we take for granted and it enables us as humanity to build things that we could only imagine before. 2009, the introduction of blockchain and Bitcoin can be seen as two separate inventions, okay? I'm going to be talking a few minutes about blockchain and then I'm going to be delving more into money itself. As we all know, blockchain came to solve an age-old problem of having a middle person keeping track of transactions and ownership, okay? We've been using the system as humanity for many, many years, but it has its drawbacks. We're talking about, you know, banks, other companies, governmental companies. And one of the drawbacks that can happen when you have a middle person, a third party, that's in the middle of every transaction, first of all, what happens if its data is breached and changed, right? That's a problem and tampered with. What happens if this middle person, the middle party, becomes one-sided and prefers a certain amount of people and doesn't prefer the others, okay? What about the vulnerability of having it centralized? Look at what happened two weeks ago with Facebook and Instagram being down. We all saw how powerful having a centralized entity if it's breached or if it goes down. Look how it, um, uh, I'd say, um, uh, kind of damages what we've been doing. Do you know that in that same day, 15 million people joined Telegram, okay? So we know that having centralized entities has its downsides, okay? And that's even before talking about the growing power of a centralized entity and what it can do with this power, and we're going to be looking at that a little bit more in depth. So blockchain came to solve all, all of these different kind of problems. It can be used in many different areas, but I think that one of the interesting ones is has to do with money and currencies, okay? So we spoke about blockchain, now let's talk a little bit about money itself. And I'm going to start with a question for the people in the audience here. What is money? Feel free to talk. I'm an Israeli. We talk over each other. <laughs> yes. yes. Sorry? Debt. 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 Okay. What is, I'd say, I'll, I'll try that and make my question more clear. What is the definition of money? Okay. A value system? Yes. The most basic definition about money is a tool for human collaboration. How did people collaborate with each other before money was invented? Do you guys remember? They used to do bartering, right? They would come to the market either on Fridays in some of the countries, on Saturdays, on Sundays. They would come with their tomatoes and their carrots and their sheep and start bartering. Like, if two tomatoes, give me three cucumbers, right? Let's go to the sheep person and see if we can get one sheep from that, okay? And money came in order to solve the problem of all of the people needing to be at the same time in the same place with all of the products. Okay, it's a tool. What was the first kind of money? Who knows? You guys know it. Answer. It was natural resources. Okay, natural resources. It could be shells, it could be salt, it could be oil. It could be something that is not too common, right? It needs to be valuable. And it needs a little bit of work in order to create it. Okay? Is there something wrong with the microphone or is it just me hearing it? There is. Do you want to change the microphone? Can you hear me better now? All right. Okay. So the first money was money was actually the first money that was invented was actually natural resources. But we've all been born into a paradigm that governments are the ones that are creating money, right? This is not a law of nature. This is something 
that was created by humans, that governments are the ones that are creating money. And this has been going on for a few hundred years, until 2009, which could be seen as, I'd say, some sort of social experiment, okay? And the question that it raised was, why are governments the only ones that are creating money, okay? And after the invention, or the, I'd say the coming out of Bitcoin, we've seen some sort of shift of other entities coming and creating money. And I'm talking about about 10, 20,000 different companies around the world during 2017 and 2018 up to the point of these years that came up with their own kinds of digital currencies, okay? 95% of them, by the way, lost 95% of their value, which we're going to be talking about in a minute. But right now, as we speak, there are more than 4,000 different currencies or tokens that are being traded in exchanges around the world. Not only that, new ideas that come with these kinds of money or token were invented. Ethereum introduced smart contracts. What are smart contracts? The idea is that when you transfer digital money, you're actually transferring code. So why should this code only have the value that is transferred? Why can't the code not include some sort of little computer program? Okay? And that's what smart contracts are. They're actually small computer programs that are transferred with the money itself, and they can be some sort of contract that says if the money has, um, uh, if the, the, sh the shipment has arrived to the buyer, then the money can be used. Okay? So think of them as little contracts with code that can tell how the money should behave when it's being transferred. So technologically, at this very moment, anybody in the world can actually issue money. Okay? Not only that, you can program that money. That means that anyone sitting here, reflect themselves, or any company sitting here, could have their own money being created. Technologically, that's possible. It's not necessarily something that we want to do, and it's not something necessarily that there's a reason to do, but technologically, it's available. It opened the long tail, if you guys remember from economics, the long tail, now anybody can create, just like anybody could post a video, right, when YouTube came out, okay? Now the thing is that for private people, there is still no use case or business reason to create a currency. It hasn't been yet invented. That doesn't mean that in 10 years from now, we're not gonna know a little girl from Alabama that created her own currency and became a millionaire, and she's gonna be the next Kim Kardashian, and all of a sudden in this room are gonna go and say, shoot, why do I not think about that business model? But at this time, again, regular personal people do not have a real reason to come and create digital currencies. But on the other hand, companies do, okay? And we can see a really good example with Facebook, which I think it was two years ago, came out and said, had an idea. Why don't we create a currency, they call it Libra, and they, later on they changed the, the name a few times, and they wanted to create their own money. Now, why would a company want to create its own currency? Does anybody have an idea? Feel free to answer. <laughs> Am I boring you? Power. What kind of power? How can they get power from it? From what? From from people. Have power over people. Okay. That's that's an interesting point. Yes. For the data, right, and which connects the power. So the reason for companies to come and create their own currency, especially for big companies like Facebook, is first of all they're saving the amount of commission. I asked a question earlier. Um, why are we still using the, the credit card systems? Because they're taking so much money and you know, they're taking a lot of commissions in the middle of the way. If Facebook had their own currency, they could take that commission if they wanted, or they can, you know, save that commission from going into the hands of, 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 of the big uh, credit card companies. But not only that, they can reach a bigger customer base, right? Not everybody is banked. You know, there's a lot of people that are unbanked in, in the world. If Facebook or Amazon could reach these people, and give them digital wallets, they could sell to more people, right? But mostly, Facebook gets more data, and Facebook knows how to monetize this data. Obviously, you know, everybody knows the story that it didn't, it didn't, it didn't happen, and Facebook had to stop in the, in the process, now they're thinking of doing it again, they renamed it DM. But that was kind of a starting point that started some sort of global arms race between whom? Between the governments around the world that wanted to also create their own digital currencies, okay? 
So if you look around, you can see that many of the countries that we know, including England, the, uh, Europe, the, America with their dollar, South Korea, Japan, China, they're all talking about creating their own digital currencies, which are called central bank digital currencies. Okay? The most advanced is who? China. Okay? And this is the point that's very interesting. China rolled out their digital currency, I think it was like uh, something about a year ago or something like that, and they made it very interesting. They told everybody, listen, if you guys want to get the present of, let's say, $100, just download the app of the Chinese digital currency. And people did that. After they downloaded the app, they really did get the money. I think it was something like $70 or something like that. But then they realized something very interesting. They cannot transfer the money from their wallet to other people. Not only that, when they wanted to go and buy things with the money that they bought, they went to stores and then they realized that they could only use this money in specific stores. Remember, all of this is programmed with the smart contract. Not only that, when they went into the stores that they wanted to buy things in, that were on the list of stores that you could buy in, they realized that they can only buy specific products. And the most interesting thing was that after a certain amount of time, let's say two months, if you didn't use the money in your wallet, what happened to the money? It disappeared. Okay? This is all possible technologically. It's smart contracts on digital money. Now, if you've been um, following the headlines around the world, you know that China has been trying to ban Bitcoin and digital currencies, right? They came out, I think it was last week, okay? And they declared that all cryptocurrency transactions are illegal. Hmm, now we understand why. This is like a, a way out of the system, right? People use digital currencies, and the data is not kept with the, the digital yuan. There's a loophole in the system, right? What's happening in the other countries? Did you guys see this? This is also from a few weeks ago. The Bank of England tells ministers to intervene on digital currency programming. The Bank of England has called on ministers to decide whether a central bank digital currency should be programmable, giving the issuer control over how it's spent by the recipients. Okay? One of the points that you guys spoke about and answered was the data that gets accumulated when we're talking about digital currencies, okay? This data is one of the driving points, both in China and for the digital Facebook coin, okay? And for other entities wanting to create digital currencies. And I want to give a little example of how interesting data can be and how we can look at all of this that's happening from a different point of view. Who knows what this is? This is a coffee shop. It was next to the Brown University in the United States. And it was very interesting in this coffee shop. When Patrick's came in and wanted to buy coffee or croissants, they did not pay with money. Can you guess what they were paying with? They were answering questionnaires. Okay? People coming into this coffee shop answered questions. They were actually giving given questionnaires, and then when they answered it, they got their coffee or their croissant. Okay? An interesting thing was that the end, at the end of that year, out of 30 people that were accepted to one of the biggest banks in that area, 27 of them were patrons of this coffee shop. So is this a coffee shop or is this the human resources engine that gives the data to employers? Okay? Now I want us to think back. When people are answering questions and questionnaires, and getting something in return. What does that make their data into? They're paying with what? With their data. What does that mean? That their data is actually a currency. Now when we sit here and we're thinking about, we're saying, wait, this is kind of crazy. What do you mean that data is a currency? But I want to remind you that each and every one of us has been paying with their data for services. And what am I talking about? When we're using Google or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat or anything, what are we paying with for the service that we're getting? With our data, correct? This is a business model that we've all been used to doing, okay? So why do you surprised that people come and want to pay with data the for their coffee? Now, if we know that data is a currency, the question is, what is its price, okay? What is it worth? Is the data that the students were giving worth more or less than the cup of coffee that they received? 
is the data that we are paying in order to receive the services that we get from Google or from Facebook. Is our data worth more or less than you guys think? More, how do we know that? You know this economically very simply, how do we know that? Because? Not only compounds, if Google is making money over our data, that means that our data is valued in the amount that Google is making as revenue. Okay? This kind of needs to make us stop and think just a minute. If this is the case, why are we not the ones that are keeping the data for ourselves as a currency? Okay? Why can we not keep it and maybe this is the future of money? Maybe the future of money is us paying with our own data for the services that we get. Maybe we should have a wallet that keeps our own data and then we can pay for it and see where we get a better exchange rate for it. Maybe there should be exchanges that come and we can sell our data and get other currencies with it. Okay? And that's, by the way, one of the questions that, that have been raised originally with everything that has to do with blockchain and decentralization. I was debating about showing you guys this um, slide and another kind of implementation that could happen with what's happening with technology. This is a patent. You can look this up. This is for real. It's applied by, can you see it from there? Application filed by Microsoft Technology. The year that it was applied was June 2020. Okay? You can look this up. I'm going to read it to you. Okay? Cryptocurrency system using body activity data. The abstract is this. Human body activity associated with the task provided to a user may be used in a mining process of a cryptocurrency system. The cryptocurrency system communicatively coupled with the device of the user may verify if the body activity data satisfies one or more conditions set by the cryptocurrency system and award cryptocurrency to the user whose body activity data is verified. That means that there is a patent by Microsoft that says theoretically it's like we're wearing a, a watch that sees how many steps we're doing. We could be paid for this body activity. Okay? Now, I'm going to let your imagination wander. This technology exists. How can it be implemented? On the one hand, we have the implementation of, okay, great, if somebody's doing sports, let's pay them for it, we're getting a healthier lifestyle, right? What if it's used in a different way? Okay? And you let your mind go wild. This is what technology is enabling us. This could also be the future of money. So now, is it a wonder that those who know how to monetize data would also want to create their own currency? Okay? They know how to create the money. And is it not a legitimate question to ask, why are people not the owners of their data and have the power to decide who to sell it to? You know, all these questions are around us and they're happening around us. And I think that if we kind of like zoom out and look at it on a historical perspective and we see what is happening right now in the world, we're kind of lucky because we're in the middle of seeing the next step in the evolution of money. It started out with bartering, it continued with natural resources and metals. It came to countries creating their own currencies, the banking systems, everything that we're talking about. And now we're at a junction point historically of where we want to continue to take humanity and money. And I think that one of the questions that each and every one of us needs to ask itself is are we also witnessing the next step in the, I'd say, the development of human ideologies, where do we want these technologies to take us as humanity? Okay? Do we want them to go to the, I'd say, the examples that I showed you guys that could be done by centralized entities and by companies or governments that we don't know what their ideology behind them is? Do we want it to go in different directions because the possibility is in the hands of each and every one of us? We are the ones that are now writing history, actually. And how will the future look like when all of us settles? Well, that's going to be determined by each and every one of us. I'm going to 
wrap this up and say that it's interesting to see how innovation has kind of like a ripple effect. And, and we can see how an idea or technology that was actually invented, I'll remind you, the idea was to decentralize and give power to the people. How it can, the same technology could be used and implemented in order to give power to those who already have the power to begin with. I'm going to end with a quote that seems to be relevant, even though I've been, you know, uh, giving lectures for so many years. And it's a quote by Gordon Moore, who is one of the founders of Intel, that said that change has never happened this fast before, but it will never be this slow again. Thank you.